This week's episode of the Religious Studies Project is brought to you by Equinox Publishing, a company that, like the RSP, has got a strong focus on method and theory and innovation in format. They are working quite closely with our sponsor, the NAASR, and in fact they've got a couple of books just coming out um, in the NAASR Working Papers series. First, we have uh, Method Today, Redescribing Approaches in the Study of Religion, which is edited by former RSP editor Brad Stoddart, and uh, also uh, out just now, Religion and Theory and Practice, Demystifying the Field for Burgeoning Academics by Russell McCutcheon, who is um, closely involved with the RSP in many, many ways. Um, go and check those out. If you're interested, Equinox is offering us a discount of 25% off. Just use the code RELIGION when ordering the book. That's uh, RELIGION for 25% off from Equinox Publishing. Now, here's this week's episode. Welcome back. Week two already. Um, I'm David Robertson, and I'm joined as ever by... Christopher Carter. And uh, very lugubrious sounding this morning, Chris. Mm. Um, You're about to hear a lot more of Chris because we are about to give you the roundtable that he chaired at the EASR conference a couple of months ago now. Um, And it was a bit of an ad hoc... uh, gathering of all of the RSP people that were there uh, to reflect on this conference and the conferences in general you know what's the point of academic conferences what do we get out of it and you know different different levels of experience and so on and so forth I'm going to stop wittering on because they're going to do the wittering for me so I'll pass right over now to Chris Welcome to the podcast studio in Bern, Switzerland, on the final day of the European Association for the State of Religions Conference on Multiple Religious Identities. I'm Chris Carter, and I'm joined here for an impromptu roundtable by some of my esteemed colleagues. I'm going to say, let's let's go round um, uh, to my right. Um, so I'm Chris, and uh, you should all know me, listeners. If you don't, then then what are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> Who have we got here? I'm Sammy Bishop. I am a PhD student based in Edinburgh and also I'm involved with the Religious Studies Project, sometimes interviewing, sometimes helping them out in other respects. And it is great to be here. I'm Angela Polka and I'm also a PhD student but I live trained at university. And um, I don't know why I'm here, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to. <laughs> we'll find out later. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a man behind the sound desk there yeah. with a beard that's more impressive than mine. <laughs> oh, that's so kind. Um, well, my name is Moritz Klink. I'm, um, I'm also a PhD student here from Bern. Um, I'm doing PhD somewhere in between sociology of religion, epistemology, and uh, the academic study of religion, or whatever the uh, most recent name of this discipline might be. <laughs> and uh, also, I am a podcaster, and this is why I uh, built this studio for this conference, and I'm very happy to see it in such a good use and yeah. yeah, and listeners um, will really be appreciating the sexy sound quality <laughs> of everything that's been coming out of this conference. And, and who's the last And individual? lastly, lastly, and least. A, uh, and least, last and least, uh, Tom White. Uh, I'm a, also a PhD candidate uh, from the University of Otago, where it is very wintry, uh, in the South Island of New Zealand, mostly looking at religion, law, and climate change in Fiji. So, Moritz, you've um, you've got us all together here, and so I'm going to sort of pass over to you to stir the pot, yeah. as it were. Cheers. So, and the idea I uh, I had in mind when uh, when thinking about make, um, making this uh, a reality uh, to come together for a last roundtable at this conference was uh, actually just. I would be interested in some uh, reflections and possible criticism of the the conference and and what is happening here because every one of us I assume is uh, well now getting used to uh, traveling to conferences like these um, telling others about uh, his or her research and uh, so we are uh, this is what we are doing this is our one part of our business and so we um I think uh, can 
take the time to reflect a bit on what we are actually doing here, if it is the discourse we are all looking for or we are so interested in, or what uh, what if not this, then what else do we do here? And, um, and to have a conversation, because um, at least, but I'm also, uh, this is just already... Uh, uh, telling you what I was experiencing. But um, um, at least I think it is uh, some the most important thing you can uh, experience on these kind of uh, conferences and events is that, um, well, uh, you get into conversations now. Sometimes and they are very fascinating. Sometimes you want to find your way out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Call your own eyes out sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, also that. Um, but yeah, so uh, a conversation seemed to be uh, the fitting, uh, the fitting end of that kind of uh, event. So yeah, I'm very glad you all joined me for this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I would be interested in your opinion about this conference. I'm a bit biased because you know I'm a local, so this happens in Bern. So I I shouldn't start. <laughs> Uh, I guess, but uh, maybe some of you have uh, impressions, ideas. Well, my immediate reaction is that I have spent <laughs> so much time uh, podcasting and um, I decided that this conference would be a chance for me to, to, to film various little bits of video and whatnot, which has been a useful experience. I think has really ramped up the engagement from folk um, who haven't been able to be here. But my actual... Um, impression of this particular conference has been somewhat uh, limited because I've been running around so much. I, I have seen something like, I don't know, 10 to 15 papers, but that's not quite, you know, you should be <laughs> normally expecting to see sort of maybe at least double that, this sort of thing, but that's what mm -hmm. happens. So um, uh, perhaps someone who... Uh, well, Angela's been the, probably the most uh, participatory because the rest of us have been running around doing podcasts. So. <laughs> I've been running around from a paper to another or from a tunnel to another, so <laughs> still running. But <laughs> Yeah, uh, this was my first EASR conference and I really enjoyed it. Uh, maybe the only critique that I have is that... Um, all the panels on the same topic were at the same time. So it was really difficult to, there were like, for example, some time slots mm -hmm. where I really wished I had the gift of ubiquity and mm -hmm. <laughs> other time slots. And yeah. there, there yeah. was really nothing relevant to my research, at least, of course, um, still interesting panels, but uh, not quite relevant um, to my mm -hmm. research. So I would have liked to um, attend more uh, panels on my research which were uh -huh. actually there but at the same time as others so mm. but maybe this was also the intention in a way to uh, bring together uh, scholars from different research areas and to give them by <laughs> this kind of overlap i don't know if that was the intention <laughs> I, I was just just to interpret it in a I'm very sure friendly that, way yeah. but i think to give them the chance to uh, look beyond their own uh, work mm. they're doing to see what the broader field of the european mm. studies of religion uh, people are doing this is also i think the only chance you you get because mm. other uh, normal you yeah that's that's a fair point actually i, I would say because uh, we you come to conferences and it, the you know at the start of this conference i thought oh damn, there's about <laughs> five or six different panels on the nuns, the secular, all the stuff. It, I'm going to have to go to those, but equally, uh -huh. I've kind of, you know, heard all I need to hear, perhaps. Not all I need to hear, but if I, if I want to approach those scholars, I can approach them. We can have dialogue anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I sort of felt I was going to have to attend them because they were there because I didn't want to miss out on, you know, that key snippet. Mm. At the end of the day, I actually didn't go to that many because of my podcasting schedule and whatnot. But I sometimes do find that at a conference, if it's the panels that you go to just because it sounds vaguely interesting but isn't <laughs> quite connected to your own research <laughs> that you can suddenly find actually there's a really good connection mm -hmm. opens up a whole new vista in a way that you aren't ever going to just pick up a journal article that's not on your topic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. read it you know, much as we would all like mm -hmm. to there's only so many hours in a day so a conference can be that mm -hmm. that way mm -hmm. um, has anyone had that sort of revelation at this one where we, we saw a paper that we didn't really you know we went along to just 
because it was in a panel with something else or because uh, there was nothing else in the schedule and we thought might as well. I, I've ended up going to a lot of education or kind of the role of religion in schools, um, schools as ideological production sites whereby, you know, people are being trained in citizenship or where schools are sites of contested religious identity, you know, the crucifix, the burqa. Um, and without any intention, I've ended up having quite a education and religion focused conference, which mm. isn't really my discipline or kind of key area, but it's been kind of quite nice to move into that and become more familiar with that subject area. Um, but yeah, I think there's a point in picking a theme and then trying to go deep rather than doing a random pick and mix of, uh, you know, an entire breadth of the, uh, discipline mm. because it, it loses a certain coherency, which I've, and that coherency with the education panels I've really enjoyed. Mm. Just on the topic of themes as well, I was thinking about conference themes and how this one was multiple mm -hmm. religious identities. And I don't know how many papers actually speak to that, that I've been to. And then I was just kind of wondering sometimes what the point of having a theme of a conference is, because everyone knows that at the ASR, you'll go if you want to present a paper. And sometimes you can mould it to the conference theme just for the sake of it. Sometimes it just seems like a bit of a facade, I think. Mm -hmm. My one bit of input on that, well, I'm sure I'll end up having a bit more. So um, I've been doing a history project of the British Association for the Study of Religions. And for a number of years now, we've um, ended up um, having a conference theme, um, but when I went back through the records, um, the conferences didn't used to have themes. Um, back in the day, it was just uh, like sort of 10 old white men gathering in effectively a living room <laughs> and having a chat. There would be one paper, and that was the conference. It then expanded to two papers, one in the <laughs> evening and then one the following morning, and that's what the association was for, for decades. And then as things grew and grew bigger, and then they started to have an annual lecture, mm -hmm. um, but there still wasn't a conference theme. Mm -hmm. And then what seems to have happened at some point um, in the mid nineties, a couple of years after that annual lecture was established, the annual lecture then became the conference theme. It was like, we're going to have mm -hmm. a keynote. Mm -hmm. They'll speak on this. Then it seems to be, we'll try and get everyone to speak around that topic. And I suppose the justification is that it, it's a way for having a, a relatively coherent conversation but that never really happens. Mm. You know, like mm. the, the, the conferences might produce a conference volume of like, you know, key papers. Uh, but I think most conferences I go to now, they would even struggle to find enough coherency mm -hmm. for that volume. Mm -hmm. And it's been proposed at the BASR recently that perhaps we just abandon the theme and say that it's a conference for scholars working in or on religion in Britain mm. and just leave it at that. And mm -hmm. tell them what the keynotes are, and the keynotes might produce a certain sort of discourse just by their power position as being the, the keynote <laughs> speeches. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's unclear now what the utility is. Any any thoughts from? from well, I, I think it also relates to you know you can only go to so many conferences each year. Um, I mean, I'm in New Zealand, so you know. Uh, unless the conference is in New Zealand, it's a very expensive exercise in going to conferences. So how do you select which ones to go to? Yeah, that's um, a good question. And, and maybe that is where the theme comes into play, because yes, there'll be a core constituency who go to every European Association conference, right? But for others who don't have that luxury, then having the theme provides the justification. Yeah, um, I don't know whether the theme actually helps you with that, <laughs> to be honest. I think, I think that if you want to present your research, then you'll present your research, never mind the theme. Yeah, <laughs> I guess you, once you go to a conference where uh, you'll find scholars uh, sort of in your field that can give you feedback or that you can network with. So... It's not something that the theme will help you with, mm. I, I think. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what are the, the criteria with which you choose a conference? I mean, um, the, the, the exotic location, 
the uh, location of your family on the travel routes, <laughs> um, networking opportunities, um, who else is going to be there and what kind of feedback you might get on your paper. Mm. Um, you know, and it's, it's a juggle between all of these different issues, isn't mm. it? Uh, you know, some more uh, honourable and some more uh, profane. Not always um, purely professional. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that's okay, isn't it? Mm. You know, it's one of the... Well, I'd say many perks of an academic life. You know, we can all bitch and moan about all the various stresses and strains, but the, the travelling to conferences is one of the perks. Oh, definitely. Sometimes it's funded. Sometimes one decides, well, I need a holiday anyway, and mm. that might be a good environment to go to. So, <laughs> uh, um, I don't, Yeah, mostly I do it based on the sort of network of scholars, you know, I, I, I go to BASR now every single year and I will continue because that's become my sort of family. Mm. It's a, but it's a much smaller conference. This is my first European one since 2013. Again, because the financial commitment is quite heavy, but I would have come regardless of what the theme was. But then there are other conferences like there's the non-religion and secularity research network in a, in a few weeks. And well, I go to that because of the, the topic. Mm. Um, and, yeah, but that's more to do with the network. Like sort of, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever actually gone to a conference because of a specific theme. It's more, I've gone to, I want to go to that organization's conference rather than, mm -hmm. mm. Uh, but maybe that's just. Although even though I've just been, you know, saying that, themes are pointless this year's BASR I only put in a paper because it did directly relate to my research and I felt like I probably should <laughs> yeah well I, I think the, uh, the the theme of conference is also the only way to uh, at least um, at least invite people to talk about something different or put it in, just look at it from a different angle they are normally doing um, and they're normally telling people about their research. And so for applying to uh, get a paper uh, in, you have to at least, uh, I don't know, tentatively um, um, put in some reference to the conference theme. And uh, I think it's a good way. It would be better, or sometimes I think it could be better if uh, people are directly invited to talk about this Mm -hmm. Like I know this one, uh, this person. I know him or her. She she is might be an expert on this and that. I would like to hear her talk about this. Although it might not be the mm -hmm. current research project she's working on, um, but inviting her to to say something about that um, would help to I don't know stimulate uh, another con mm -hmm. kind of conversation than just repeating exactly. oneself. Mm -hmm. um, three points. <laughs> I said I was not going to talk too much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we're maybe having two conversations like we shouldn't allow the uh the behavior of scholars um who tend to just go i will well i'll fire in whatever paper anyway and just put a vague allusion to the theme in you know that's what we maybe default to doing but the the ideal where everyone actually engages with the theme you know that's maybe still the ideal to aim for and we shouldn't be conflating sort of behaviors mm. with ideals. Mm. Another point is that some of us, I've certainly had the experience of being at very small conferences that you might more describe as workshops. I've been at one on um, atheist identities, mm -hmm. one on religious indifference, mm -hmm. um, at where there's maybe 15 to 25 scholars and it is very intense, very focused discussion. And those conferences have always produced for me, the best, mm -hmm. uh, best output. So maybe there's a scale thing. And the final point is that I've got a, a friend who is in um, business studies in marketing. And she was telling me you know, she was applying for her first conference. And the selection criteria are, are very different. You have to write your entire paper ahead, yeah. submit it, Yeah. And then they accept it or reject it. And then you come and present a shortened version of your paper. Mm. So we're used to presenting a very short, vague abstract. And conferences tend to be eager for people to come. Whereas if the conference was having 
thousands more people than they could actually take applying, then the selection criteria would be quite different mm -hmm. and the coherence of the conference would probably be much higher than it is in, in our discipline, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if you could uh, actually call that kind of uh, workshop experience you had a, uh, a conference because I think is. Uh, I, I think that would uh, just mix up terms and uh, mm. uh, put it in a better light than uh, conferences deserve, I guess. <laughs> Because uh, then, uh, well, at least in my experience, and um, I go to different conferences in religious studies, but also uh, in sociology, I, I never find the discourse there. I just find repetition. Uh, never actually something really new or interesting, at least just a few papers presented. And this is in kind of a contradiction to the, to the, just the bare fact that there are more and more conferences that you could go to and you should attend or you're supposed to if you want to, uh, I don't know, work on your career or something like that. So, um, I find it really, um, challenging to think about, um, what to do at conferences like what is it we are doing and when we are doing conferencing hmm. um and i think uh, more and more it uh, turns out to be some uh, just some occasion uh, you meet each other and talk to each other yet uh, the papers and the panels are so full of papers and panels and it's so in such a short time uh, so that um, but is that okay in the sense of Because I've often said that sometimes the papers are the excuse. Yeah. Hmm. They're, yeah. The, they're the excuse for the, the funding. They're the excuse that you give to justify to yourself going. And sometimes I've found them, you know, I will use a conference paper as a way to force myself to, mm -hmm. to write something that I've been meaning to write for ages. But then, yeah, the valuable things are the things like we're doing right now or the exactly. things that happen in the coffee mm -hmm. breaks yes. or that um, excellent... Uh, Excellent night out dancing to, to Thriller <laughs> with uh, Steve Sutcliffe and Giovanni Casadio and everyone the other night. Yeah, those are the things that stay with you and that sort of humanize the scholarship, but then also all the um, conversations that happen around the conference. Yes. Um, In which case, do you think more time should be dedicated to social interactions? Like you could have... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like take one panel out and just say people who want to gather in a room and talk about this topic but then, have a round table. But then they wouldn't. Yeah, they, they if it's too much time uh, between the panels, I think they would not. They would just leave. Uh, they they were in. split up in very small groups, friends they haven't seen each other for a long time, and then they uh, leave uh, the venue, and then they are all around scattered, all and around the, the city. And I think some of the conversations you have between the panels, this was at least something I was thinking about uh, the other day, some of the conversations you have between the panels is actually a uh, gaining from the fact that you have to run off just in a few minutes so you get out your point very quickly and mm. hopes to to find someone some some laughs and then go <laughs> go on your uh, daily routine at these conferences so i think if they're too long of a break between that's might not even but if it wasn't a break if it was like this room can be dedicated to this yes. subject if you want to have a conversation about it then go there yeah, yeah. maybe we don't i think i would like to <laughs> Don't sound so skeptical. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Well, maybe you shouldn't call it a room where you go to to have the conversations, but maybe you can call it a podcasting studio where you also have the uh, ability to yeah. record. Yeah, if conversation is the valuable thing, then it would be good to facilitate that. Yeah, you know. But, 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 <laughs> that's uh, true. The, yeah, my my facetious thing there is that maybe there's slightly you know ways that be slightly more innovative than. Is a room go and talk well, but, that's but, a very but basic but presentation the, 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 <laughs> the spirit of it i think is probably quite good more yes yeah, like more barbecues for example i'm not saying they all need to be um, filled with free alcohol and things <laughs> but if there was a barbecue every night and that uh, and all those conversations well then maybe not as many people would come every night mm. but um it, it Like those are the places yeah. where the exciting things are. What, what do we think about kind of the stratification of people at various levels in their academic careers? Um, you know, having a junior scholars meeting tends to be, you know, something a lot of conferences are doing this de uh, these days, uh, workshops for postgraduates. Uh, there hasn't really been that here. It's generally been, you know, far less hierarchically um, organized. Mm. But 
to some degree, you know, what, what do you miss out through not having those, not having kind of a postgraduate kind of, um, talking shop or, um, being a bit more aware of facilitating meetings through the hierarchy, which is still a very kind of important aspect of university institutions. Um, so should we be doing it by topics or should we be perhaps doing it by kind of, you know, career experience? Um, any thoughts on that? I think I'd prefer it by topic. Hmm. And I don't know if that's because in Edinburgh, I feel like I have a good postgraduate community where we can share certain experiences in that way. And obviously it would be good to come across other postgrads from other places, but I feel like I would benefit more from meeting people at all levels within my subject area. And it would be great if some of them were also postgrads at the same level as me, but then also people who have more experience and a, mm. a more range, I think. Yeah, I usually prefer people with more experience just because they can uh, teach me something about how to improve my research and how to do stuff, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. But of course, even yeah, uh, a conversation on the same topic with a postgraduate can be yeah, beneficial as well. Mm. Yeah, the more the more democratizing things are, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I, I do like it when you get to rub alongside um, people, you know, right at the the top end of the field, right at the bottom, and and where titles don't really matter. I mean, like last night we were just casually sitting with Vaco Anton and um, just having a beer and talking, mm. and, and there was no sort of pretense of you know he's really important. Yeah. Um, we should, you know, we should be deferring here. Um, I mean, sometimes yeah. you don't realise who they are until afterwards anyway. <laughs> which, is e- which is even better yeah. as well. That was one thing. Um, I remember uh, a Peggy Morgan um, organised the BSR's 40th anniversary conference. I think she said that she insisted on not having name labels mm. because it means that you go around the conference and you spend the whole time sort of peering at everyone's <laughs> chest um, maybe somewhat inappropriately trying to see what their name is and everyone's looking around for a better person to talk to and they're, they're waiting to catch that name mm-hmm. and apparently the objection was but but you could be talking to someone really important and not realise it and, and her justification was well maybe that that's the point Yeah. if you want to introduce yourself you introduce yourself you want to know someone's name you ask them their name um a lot of the name badges thing can maybe actually be a sort of way of kind of spoiling those conversations a little bit. I know yeah, it, it, it does save you from the forgetting of names once yeah. you've already been introduced. And also, especially when you have so many people from uh, different countries, it's yeah. really hard to catch the name properly yeah. <laughs> unless you have the tag. Yeah. yeah, and also uh, I think it is uh, just uh, also kind of a misconception of what uh, how networks or networking works. I mean, in a network, your your value is defined by uh, being a knot and the ties you have. So uh, the name is uh, some kind of a label of this knot. So talking to someone who has a name or might have a name, it also means you get the connections you might be looking for so if it is for for just coming together and talk about research questions or uh, something you're really interested in like as topic wise or something then this might be a good idea to uh, get rid of the badges but Mm. if not if it is for networking then it is really helpful i Mm. mean i can't find the people yeah and yeah there's been so many instances where i have seen you know you spot a name badge and you don't know what the person looks like but you you do know their research and you spot the name badge and then it's like yeah hello i should yeah. speak to you just you know so yeah exactly yeah but that was just feeding into the going right back to what tom was saying do do we want to be coming to this sort of conference and having you know sitting down just with early career skills well that's what we're doing right yeah now, isn't it? <laughs> I well, think, well, yes, yes it is and it's not surprising i think because uh, all the others are busy doing uh, business as usual so um podcasting is not something that is quite uh, usual yet maybe um maybe we could also talk about this uh, kind of institution of a of a podcasting studio at conferences as a kind of a po- opportunity to get together and to record uh, some conversations and to be proven the the and the the real thing we are looking for at these kind of events but uh, uh coming back to the question i think it's sometimes not only 
is, is might be the only way to <clears throat> uh, might be the only way to uh, get uh, the the input you need because from uh, professors established professors you normally tend to get just the usual yeah. uh, the usual thing you you find in their books and papers and I, I think the point I was driving at and I'm not sure if there's a difference between say a European conference and an American conference my suspicion completely mm-hmm. ungrounded is that an American conference might have a more stratified um, forums where for early career researchers you could meet up um, but that's not for sociability this is for the professionalization of the trade mm-hmm. and there's a lot more more to this mm-hmm. than simply knowing your topic very well and perhaps kind of working uh, doing workshops where you know you are kind of professionalized um, to a degree um, would provide that additional uh, aspect to attending a conference particularly for early career researchers that just simply attending um, topic-based panels would provide mm. so that, I think that was kind of where I was ruminating around um, but of course there's drawbacks to that as well because you are missing out on on the more, more interesting stuff and just learning the, uh, the the CV building skills and so on and so forth. I mean, just um, reminding uh, Paul Feyerabend's uh, analysis of uh, of uh, anything goes and the critique of the method and uh, and stuff. Um, he's, I think, he he showed that um, well that. Uh, the innovative research is not coming from the old established ones, but from uh, from them who who haven't read the important books you uh, should uh, should have read at mm. that time or didn't understand it, and then you innovate uh, the hell out of this yeah uh, endeavor we call academia. Mm. So that yeah. might be the place to be here. Exactly. Well, we we've always seen. Uh, the religious studies project as a way of, um, you know, there there are all these existing academic structures there. There's hierarchies, mm-hmm. there's um, conferences, there's journals and everything. And we, we never saw the RSP as a way of um, su- supplanting that or, or um, but as a way of kind of democratizing things a bit and a, a way of sort of, you know, humanizing scholarship mm-hmm. and um, having conversations alongside what's going on in an alternative fashion and you're providing ways of accessing research and ideas that are maybe a little bit more irreverent a little little more accessible and still you know acknowledging that the other structures are there Mm. but you know do we want to be professionalized well to to an extent (laughs) you have to be we we want to be employed we want to be employed but equally um there's there's a lot going on in the uh, the existing structures that is there just because of of habit and tradition um, and authority and um, these little these little ways these little things that we're doing um, can hopefully be ways of of challenging that or, or just forcing it to justify itself. I'm, I'm speaking in huge generalities here, but uh, um, you know things shouldn't be done the way that they are done just because. Mm. Um, and so having little things that come yeah. in and go, hmm. Well, I, I don't think that is, uh, as, that this is actually speaking in huge generalities. I think this is the concrete reality you could uh, experience at, in these kind of uh, conferences, like that, that these connections and power struggles within academia. It's, uh, you, you can uh, really experience it here. Um, and, and so I, uh, I, I would agree, uh, that there might be, uh, a reason why we are not professionalizing in a way, I don't know, businesses have to, uh, or, uh, or get together just for networking purposes only. Because if we are not, no longer interested in our research topics, then, well, we are no longer researchers. Exactly. <laughs> so. um, Tom, you're, you may not want to, to talk about this, but you are just about to go to Hong Kong to a quite different conference, and you were describing the sort of, the, the I guess, maybe your perceived differences there, and I just maybe that might be a useful thing to bring in. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that I haven't been there yet. Yes. So, I mean, the, the, these are all kind of anticipations which could be completely grounded in kind of my misunderstandings. But it's a big public law conference uh, in Hong Kong, and something like 39 concurrent panels. Uh, so I'm not sure how many delegates that adds up to, uh, but 
pretty pretty huge because I was at the Law and Society conference in Otago last year and because you've got a lot of lawyers going to these conferences it's not just academics it's a far more kind of mixing of uh, people who apply the trade and also the people who research um, and there was a slickness to them you know everyone was slightly smarter, uh, smartly dressed and you know powerpoints ran to time and often they would be synchronized with the the, the rehearsed script um, and it is impressive it is impressive when people develop, uh, you know, sorry, um, provide a far more uh, slick presentation. I'm not sure if the ideas are any better, um, <laughs> but there, there, there was a, um, there was a sense that you know, corporate corporatization isn't all bad, and if it's a more efficient or more crisp delivery, and you know, if the powerpoints aren't failing, and people are IT savvy, and you know, they've, <laughs> they, they've they've been told to reduce their paper to three or four points because that's what people remember, and you want your papers to be efficacious and people to walk away with you know the the, the key concepts. Mm -hmm. um, that aspect of the professionalization, I think. It's worthwhile, uh, you know, learning from and replicating. Um, whether the uh, the horse will take to water, uh, uh, or whether we will kind of, you know, continue to try and, you know, preserve some of the more romantic kind of uh, off the cuff kind of um, hmm. uh, presentation styles that uh, do take place in more humanities based subjects is. Um, is something I don't know how all things will turn out, but yeah, it, it'll be very interesting to see how the Hong Kong conference, you know, differs from this one. I must say that the, you, there's a spectrum of conference presentations, right? You've got the sort of very slick end, and then you've got this, I guess, off the cuff end, and then I suppose somewhere in the middle, you've got the reading of a pre-prepared <laughs> thing, um, which I probably tend to do far off far too often <laughs> it's the default but the ones that i enjoy are either the ones that are very slick or the ones that are almost entirely off the cuff you know they've got an idea and they just turn up and and sort of <laughs> they've got a couple of points and they speak around it and you they don't really know where it's going to go before it happens but it can be great you safely. do need a certain amount of confidence in yourself as an academic yeah. to be able to do that. I think. But, but, but again, I think that comes back to the point of professionalisation, you know, mm. because it gives you those structures with which to be confident through. I, I don't think people just emerge confident individuals. They're, you know, they're, they're given the training and, and, and that kind of aspect, I think, is perhaps undervalued or mm. perhaps not you know, explored enough or not given enough assistance to people in their early careers. Well, um, I would be interested in what you think about uh, the, the formats that pr actually prepare one uh, to go to these kind of conferences. What are the, uh, the, the teaching that is required, maybe required, uh, to, to be prepared presenting in front of uh, uh, an academic professional crowd? Or is that anything you learn during studies and in, in various programs at various universities is there something that is um, reflected in in the courses or the structure uh, of the programs and is it also reflected in what it is worth uh, doing uh, career-wise because uh, um, I have the impression that uh, at the end it counts what you've written Uh, and what you, uh, the papers you published in uh, possibly well-known and established peer-reviewed journals uh, and uh, the books you uh, published. Uh, I mean, among us, there are only a few people who, <laughs> who already published books, but yet um, I think this is what counts and, um, and it does not count to be able to get a straight sentence out uh, in front <laughs> of uh, a, a crowd listening to you. And uh, in a way, I think this um, just uh, is reflected at the... Somehow it does, because it allows you to um, network with uh, other academics that, mm -hmm. um, and th that will lead to publications in some cases, so... Okay, so, mm. but this all's already, just uh, already prepares you for another written, <laughs> written publication? I don't Yeah, but you, I think that with, um, with your presentation, 
you will catch the attention on, on, on yourself as a researcher and on your research topic so that other people that are interested can contact you even afterwards or um, mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah and it's, it's not necessarily just connected to feeding into publications i mean but i suppose what, what are academic outputs their publications their larger research projects and everything um but you've got no idea i mean i've seen some presentations here that i've immediately thought I need to contact that person for this other project down the line. Or sometimes it can be someone else tells you about a paper that they heard that you weren't at. And that personal recommendation can be enough that you will then mm-hmm. yes. look at the conference program, find out who the person was, and then seek them out in some sort of other way. Yeah. Um, well, my questions were just related to uh, the, uh, the the idea that might we might the, need a professionalization mm. of this uh, of the conferences and the mm. sleek style yeah, yeah. of mm. uh, presenting five points only. I, and I, I'm saying it through five. gritted teeth. You know, yeah. I, it's, uh, I hope so. Yeah, because I think the the reason we don't need uh, uh, the reason we we don't have that kind of. Uh, well established elaborate uh, presentation style is because we're not uh, we're not uh, teaching it at universities and it doesn't count that much as writing papers uh, mm-hmm. properly and then uh, uh, to read and to hold a paper uh, literally and uh, to read a paper you uh, you you wrote that this um, the thing you do i mean we we have nothing else is that? I mean, podcasting's just uh, started to uh, get uh, uh, to get the standing in the in the yeah. discipline. Well, and, and the podcast I recorded yesterday evening, for example, with Carmen Becker, went really well in the sense that she had a, a narrative worked out for her paper, so yeah. she had a twenty-minute narrative which provided an excellent structure for what ended up being a thirty-five minute podcast. Uh But we did the same content in a much more, I hope, and the listeners can let me know, conversational and accessible way we got through it all. But the act of it being a conversation was was an alternative presentation format that will hopefully Mm -hmm. have complemented Mm -hmm. the the the, uh, presentation output. But um, maybe just to put the spotlight, so An- Angela, you're um, relatively new to the, the conference circuit in a sense, so you might be, what preparation did you get before um, you, you stepped up to the, the podium mm. to deliver your first few papers? Uh, well, actually, I find it quite easy to present in front of people because I've been teaching for a few years, and I also teach at, uh, at Leeds Trinity, so... Um, yeah, uh, and also, well, um, my um, my degrees were in Italy, so at the University of Naples, and there you have to do a lot of exams. There are quite of um, there are presentations, but without the PowerPoint, sort of. I mean, you have to orally answer to quite a few questions in a um, structured, in a well structured way. So I think that that helped me mm. to organize how I elaborate on my thoughts and on my research. Yeah. But yeah, maybe the only thing would be to... Um, yeah, I spoke to my supervisor, of course, about what would, what would be um, the, the, the main points that I have to address. So mm. it's like a, a sort of introduction, then, uh, yeah. yeah but that, was, that was what I was thinking. I mean, from my... Outside observation, you seem to have a very supportive supervisor in yeah. Susanna. I know that I've had very supportive supervisors and now mentor in Kim Knott and Steve Sutcliffe, mm-hmm. um, who have sort of walked me through a lot of these yeah. sort of mm-hmm. things that might seem quite daunting in an academic career. And I think that for me, like the first few conferences I went to and everything, having that sort of having a sort of a, a couple of more established advocates guiding me around, mm. introducing me to people, yeah. um, mm. that, that really helped. Some, had, sorry, go sorry. Uh, Sometimes it, uh, it can also help um, when you have interests beside academia. For example, uh, in my case, I think that um, since I've been a singer for uh, quite a few years, I think that that helps me. Uh, because when I'm uh, up there, it's like being on a stage and you have to perform. And so you have to, yeah. So I think that doing even other kind of activities besides academia that can help you 
uh, be more relaxed in front of people can also help. Yes, by comparison, my hobby is long distance running. And, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that's comparable you, to no. that kind of uh, you know, well, sociability yeah, aspect. Yeah, but I guess theater, for example, might be yeah. another. But well, the long distance running will help you deal with the the long. Um, the, the long keynote lectures, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the warm rooms, and yeah. b- being both are, both different ways to uh, deal with uh, stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> the one can run off easily; the other yeah. one can perform <laughs> exactly. But you wanted to say something? There's yeah, just a couple of things. Because the first EASR I went to was the one in Helsinki two years ago, I think, and I didn't present at that one, and I purposefully went just so I could go to a European conference, like suss out the level of things that were mm-hmm. happening there. And I, yeah, I had people like Steve Sutcliffe and the whole, I think we were referred to as the Edinburgh Mafia at the time because there were so many of us. And it was really nice just having those people there to introduce me uh-huh. and not having the pressure to present, but mm-hmm. be able to suss out the situation. Mm-hmm. And then also back in Edinburgh, I think in the first year of my PhD, we did a smaller uh, we called it the postgrad colloquium, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that was one where people from all over the divinity school mm-hmm. would present. Um, I can't remember whether it was a five or ten minute ten paper, minutes, mm-hmm. but they tried to organise it in a very professional way. Mm-hmm. And I think um, the day before there'd been a different conference at New College, mm-hmm. and Marion Bowman was in Edinburgh, and so mm-hmm. she came to the colloquium, and so it was quite mm-hmm. nice to have a certain level of professionalism there. Mm-hmm. Only have to present for ten minutes, mm-hmm. and it was a really good like trial run. Yeah. For future presentations, mm. but isn't it strange that we already uh, we already um, fulfill uh, all the requirements of a conference and presenting professionally, and uh, even if we are just doing a postcard or uh, uh, that kind of meetings and workshops just for us, for our sex, for our research, just to get into conversation, find other people talking about uh, interesting topics. We could do this in many different ways. We could also just meet for podcasting, for example, mm-hmm. just to bring it up once more. Um, <laughs> I think because the, the, the formats are th- so different and, and this kind of uh, head professionalization of uh, the peer pressure you then feel at these big conferences like EISR or other conferences. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's strange, I think, that we already assume all that professionalism as in that, in that way we experience it later then. And mm. there is no, there is no change. There is no real, uh, um, I, I don't know, there's no real development in presentation yeah. style or. Yeah, I mean, I can think of, we could probably come up with a lot of optimistic things. Yeah. Well, surely we could be doing this networking without, uh, and this collaboration without having to all um, have the big carbon footprint and come to this place and mm-hmm. sit through lots of papers. Mm-hmm. Maybe aren't that interested. Um, I don't know how much we would maybe all actually, the existence of the structure acts as sort of, it's a gravitational pool and people yeah. make time for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but just another anecdote, I think it's maybe over f- five years ago now that um, Russell McCutcheon added me as a friend on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And, so, <laughs> and I, I remember it happening and being like, wow, he's added me as a friend on Facebook. Uh, and I've, I've still never met him um, in face to face. And I don't I think he was, was aware of the Religious Studies Project and was just purposefully yeah. Yeah. setting out to network and create a sort of network but yeah you know, since then um, i think of russell t mccutcheon as a the kind of a, a rsp uh twitter bot because he retweets <laughs> everything he yeah. guys tweet but and he engages but but yeah. so i've now collaborated with him on a number of, of publications yeah. Yeah. i've been to conferences that he has helped organize even though he didn't end up going there <laughs> we'll bounce around facebook messages and twitter conversations and i'm now uh-huh. part of his yeah. culture on the yeah. edge yeah. thing yeah. Yeah. And all of this has happened without ever needing to go to a conference. Uh-huh. And there's been a lot of um, productive collaboration there. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not saying that we all need to start Facebook stalking and adding <laughs> people that we've never met before, because mm-hmm. that is just weird and there are issues with that. But um, there are other ways, perhaps, than necessarily coming mm-hmm. to a physical space yeah. and participating that productive scholarly collaboration can happen. We just maybe need to... Um, yeah. ignore the, or think outside the large, powerful 
pool that these things have. Mm. And you do need certain ways of making you and your research visible, because obviously you have the platform that Russell mm. was unable to find you on. So it's just ways of making that work as well. Yeah, and I, I think um, the reason I brought this up uh, again is because um, I think that uh, with podcasting we have the and that kind of um, medium that uh, gets out uh, conversations in a more in, in a proper way and uh, also uh, make it uh, possible to uh, makes it possible to uh, quote podcasts as well and uh, I think. Um, the the only few of those established scholars in the discipline already know how much downloads those podcasts get. Uh, if they if they knew, I think they would realize that their papers in their established and beloved journals never ever will find so many readers than those podcasts yeah. find downloads. I mean, we, we have listening. already in this conversation had more impact than probably. Every, every yes. yeah, this guy, this and more listeners way. than every yeah. dissertation ever been written in this. In this yeah, which but, yeah. So we, were, I mean, we briefly touched on it earlier, and you were saying that you go to a conference to mm -hmm. present, only to then write a paper afterwards. Yes. Whereas podcasting yeah. occupies that in between space where yeah. you can be quoted on it. And yes. You don't have to produce this huge written piece afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Um, We are coming up to uh, 12 o'clock, which is going to be our, our time for our wrapping up. Uh, I'm yes. using my um, my radio host uh, <laughs> thing, which Moritz has been railing against uh, the whole time. Moritz, I think, would have us talking for another three hours. If could. <laughs> yeah, But, definitely. Um, <laughs> There's no do. time limit. There's always space in the internet. There is always space on the internet, and yes. this is a point to remember. So hopefully, listeners, you've enjoyed this conversation, and um, it's maybe given you some food for thought um, about conferencing and all, maybe alternative ways that you can augment that. Um, and one way would be to participate in the conversation um, surrounding this podcast. You could record your own podcast and then respond in that way. YouTube. Um, oh, there's all these social media options and website options for, for writing um, written responses. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Just get out there and say it. Um, a, a lot of people seem to not really like typing written yeah. comments on the yeah. website because they should. But then you should definitely establish a way to get uh, uh, audio comments as well. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. there's very it's very easy to record them with uh, WhatsApp or voice memo apps on uh, smartphones. You could send it easily in a very a uh, nice format and you could include them in the podcast yeah mm. that would be a brilliant idea Moritz thank you for that You're yeah, no, no, I don't know. <laughs> excellent so yeah listeners uh, thanks for listening uh, uh, well we should all say that I suppose so for, mm -hmm. from all from all five of us here in Switzerland mm -hmm. yeah thanks. thank you for thank listening you. Well, we hope that you enjoyed um, our ramblings there. If you stay with us uh, right to the end, that was a longer episode, of course, because it was a roundtable, sticking with traditional roundtable format. And um, next week, um, it'll be the first of those interviews that we were mentioning that had been recorded in Moritz's fantastic studio. Um, it's me speaking with Susanna Crockford of the University of Ghent on um, eco-spirituality and gender. Excellent. I believe we have um we have another interview coming up later in the year on gender issues in Wicca. Is it in Wicca? Yes. Yeah. Um which I, I should have checked. I just remembered as we were speaking there, so um that would be a little uh a little well yeah, in contemporary occultism. Ah, occultism more broadly, yeah. And that was uh, Sammy Bishop, I think, Indeed. recorded that one. So we we'll have a little run of gender ones. That's that's uh, you know, long overdue probably. Um Yeah, I mean, uh, do we uh, we mentioned the ESR affair, but we should probably talk about the BASR conference which um was in collaboration with uh, Isazer, the Irish yeah. Society for the Academic Study of Religion, um, in uh, Queens in Belfast. Uh, it was a really excellent conference. Uh, Chris won't be appearing in any of the recordings, I think, due to the fact that he was basically running it and, you know, did a sterling job. But uh, unfortunately, that left the RSP stuff to me. So, um, you know, we'll get this run of Chris from ESR and then it'll be over to me at the ASR. 
uh, and that'll probably be Christmas by then. Oh, definitely. Well, uh, hopefully we'll manage to to intersperse things a little bit because uh, we don't want you getting sick of our own particular uh, thrusts, as it were. Indeed, <laughs> we have. Um, we actually have a lot of other interviews coming up. Um, we did our usual new interviewers drive before the summer and we've got a bunch of new people it's uh, really good um, yeah it's going great we they're starting to come in now we've got everybody set up and trained and uh, we're looking forward to bringing you those now mm. and we've actually um got um introductions to all of our interviewers that we're going to uh, we're going to present to you um you know sort of a week or two before their interviews are coming up to give you a sense of who these new team members are because we realized um you know you hear from us a lot um but you don't necessarily know that much about um who we are what we are doing and where we're coming from so we thought let's change that absolutely so um yeah lots to come um over the next well the six months or so Uh, so yep stay tuned we'll see you next week and as ever thanks thanks for listening the rsp is sponsored by the british association for the study of religions the north american association for the study of religion and the international association for the history of religions the religious studies project is produced by the religious studies project association scio a scottish charitable incorporated organization charity number sc0 Four seven seven five zero. Brought to you by founders and editors in chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett Fox, and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop, and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at Patreon.com slash Project RS and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.